Lord. Amen. Amen. It's good to be back. We had a, a wonderful vacation in Florida, and I know we probably still have several families that are out vacationing somewhere in the water someplace probably and uh, having a good time, but we're glad to be back. I'm glad that you're here this morning. As you can see, we're going to be studying about David defeating Goliath. And if you want to turn in your Bibles, Samuel chapter 17. Uh, I don't know, you, some of you probably haven't had a chance yet to go or maybe hasn't even seen the time-lapse video that Brother Patrick did of the VBS stage creation. But uh, they did a fabulous job. And I mean, it's going to knock your socks off when you go in the sanctuary and see it. Uh, it is just, every year they just keep raising the bar a little higher. And so it's going to be a fabulous VBS starting tomorrow uh, evening at 6.30. And uh, we're looking for a great week. Uh, a lot of hard work was already put in by folks to get the stage ready and everything and teachers preparing and for all the things that we do during VBS with the kids, and it's going to be a great week. It's going to be a lot of people will be tired of working during doing VBS at night, and the Lord will reward them for their labors. He certainly will. Into these children is some of the best things we can do, and pouring into their lives the Word of God. So, the Lord impress His blessings on this Sunday school class. Yes, ma'am. Mm. W uh, R and, and Jimmy Goswick's daughter, no, uh, niece. niece. Excuse me, bitten with a copperhead. So let's let's make sure we pray for that and her needs there in Texas. Amen. And let's pray for our services today, uh, all of our classes on the campus and our worship service. Uh, and you know it's going to be so exciting this week. Pray that kids will be touched. Some will be saved during this week. It'll be fabulous. Uh, during this VBS period of time, and we're just going to have a great week in the house of the Lord all week long, ain't we? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be gathered together with your believers. Lord, those that love you and come to hear your word, O oh God, and study the word of God together as we do. Lord, we pray, Lord, today for this special need and the niece of W.R., O oh Lord, and Jimmy Goswick, God. We pray that you would heal her of this snake bite, O oh God. We know that you can touch her so that it doesn't do any permanent damage. Lord, we pray, O oh God, over all of our services here today. Lord, every Sunday school class, every children's church class, God, that we have, Father, that you bless each and every one of the teachers and the children and the adults alike. Bring us all into the understanding of your precious word. And Lord, bless our pastor as he gives us a message today, God, for our hearts. And may our ears and our hearts be open and receptive to what you minister to us with. We pray for our VBS this whole week, O oh Lord, and those workers that have worked so hard already. Lord, that you reward them with souls, O oh God. Bless every class this week, every activity that is done, Lord, as they pour into these children's lives. We pray, God, that you'll see great fruit from that harvest, and we'll praise you in all ways and in all things. In the precious name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. So, we have been studying through 1 Samuel 16. I appreciate J.C., studying, uh, teaching for us last week about the selection of David. And we are kind of going through this anointing of David as the future king of Israel. And it's going to take some time for that to come to fruition. But that anointing had taken place. So it's, uh, it's kind of like when Jesus first did his public ministry, he kind of kept it low key to begin with. And then he started openly telling people he was the Messiah. And so it's kind of similar to that. A lot of things in David's life foreshadows, of course, the life of Jesus Christ being the king of kings, the final king of all of Israel. But as we look through those, we can see that in the Bible, and you know, we have a historical timeline that we have been going through. And when you read all the scripture text on our time chart, as well as the one that Answers in Genesis uses, you'll see that uh, these, some of the accounts of David's life is written in multiple places. And sometimes 
that gets confusing for us, especially when you're reading in Kings and Chronicles, because Chronicles is retelling in a little different slant sometimes with additional information what was in First and Second Kings. And so as you read it through, like if you're just reading the Bible through, you think, no, wait a minute, I already read this somewhere because this really sounds familiar. And then you realize it was in you know, First or Second Kings that you just finished. And so this is true also with the life of David. It's recorded in First and Second Samuel, of course, and then also in the beginning of First Kings and then the majority of First Chronicles is talking about the life of David. So the Bible was not put together in a, the way that we would think you would write a novel or a book and everything just happening really sequentially as it goes through. It was never compiled that way. But in most of your Bibles today, either in the footnotes or in the margins, it's going to cross-reference the Scripture you're reading back to where the same account is recorded in other locations of the Bible. So it, the margins and the notes help you a lot to kind of keep your head wrapped around about when you're talking, what this is talking about in the timeline for it, and what other scriptures are there. You know, we've, we've shown several times that we'll compare two scriptures to see what the difference is, and usually there's some added information in one that was not provided in the other that helps us to get a bigger picture, a fuller picture uh, from different angles about what's going on. So today we're going to be looking at how faith is demonstrated in different people and from whence do they draw uh, their confidence. Uh, In the scriptures, it's uh, talking about, if I can get it to go here, uh, in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 1, I'm going to read through uh, verse 16 to begin with here. And this is telling us the, the leading into this great battle with Goliath. Now, you know, of course, we've went through judges, right? That Israel had judges. And even when they had judges, they were in and out of idol worship that whole time. And God would raise up a judge to deliver them. They'd slip back into idol worship. He'd raise up another judge to deliver them. So they've already been on this little roller coaster thing that we talked about before, this circle that they were making. And... So they wanted a king, and so they got one in Saul. And so Saul being a new king over the Israelites, other kingdoms are taken out of that, including the Philistines, and they don't much like that. It's like this guy is going to be carving out property. He's going to be taking over livestock. He's going to be taking over vineyards. They're going to do all this because they got a new king now, and this king, as the Israelites, remember they told them, Oh, we want somebody who's going to fight our battles for us. Somebody who's going to enlarge our tent and enlarge the uh, surrounding area. And that, that, this king's going to do it. And you remember he told him, he said, yeah, but what you don't understand, he's going to be doing it with your kids, with your money, uh, with all of your land and your oxen. He's going to be using your stuff to do all this that you want him to do. And, oh, yeah, it didn't matter. We still want him. So they got him. So in 1 Samuel 17 and 1, it says, Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Sokoth, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Sokoth and Aska in the Ephes Demim. And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Elah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the side of, of the mountain on one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Now, when they're talking about a valley here, they're not talking about Shenandoah Valley, you know, something that's 100 miles wide. This was very, it's like one side of a hill and a very small valley in between them and on the other side. Uh, this was common, uh, a, a method to do this. One, they could size up the other army, but they could also easily shout at each other and be heard across this small valley. It's kind of like an, uh, a theater, if you will. And so they stood on the other side, and, and Israel stood with a valley between them. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Does anybody have a Bible that tells you what that is in our present metric systems that we use today? or? Yeah, nine, most of them are converting it to English for us as nine feet, nine inches, right? So that's a common uh, measurement that is used 
when they talk about these cubits in a span and how they were measured out. In some areas, they think it might be more like seven feet. In any way, uh, uh, you've seen some of our biggest NBA players, right? They're six, 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 eight. Most of them not seven feet, and certainly not nine feet. So, yes, brother Iggy. This is a ten foot. <laughs> yeah. So he's up there a foot off the ceiling if he's nine foot nine inches thereabouts. So it's a pretty big, pretty big feller. And so it says, and he had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the mail was 5,000 shekels of bronze. Anybody have an estimate for that in your Bibles? 125, 126 pounds on him. That's quite a bit, right? You know, when, you, you, when people lose weight and you don't appreciate how much, when they lose 25 or 50 pounds, just carry a 50-pound bag of flour around for a while. And you can, you, know, you can kind of get an idea, this is the weight that's distributed over the body. Well, that's what he had on him was 125 pounds o- over his body. That's a, a, it's metal that is meshed together that keeps spears and swords from piercing through it. It's kind of like a chain link fence, if you will, around him. Yeah, they're a little, and especially in the dark ages, they used it a lot. And he had bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders in the back, and the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the spearhead weighed 600 shekels of iron. Anybody got a measurement for that? 15 pounds, just the spearhead, not counting the beam. And his shield bearer went before him. He's the poor guy that's got to carry all this stuff for him. And he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. So he's trying to negotiate here, and he... In his mind, he is negotiating from a position of strength and power. Uh, Most believe that they were largely outnumbered, the Israelis were. Uh, Much more Philistines and had been much more battle-hardened than the Israelites. You know why that's true about the Israelites? It wasn't because they couldn't field a lot of young men, they could, but why were they not so as battle-hardened as others? Yeah, because what happened in most of the battles when God was interceding for them. He did the work. Him and his angels would slay them in the night and they'd wake up the next morning and most of them's dead. So the, so the men weren't doing a lot of the fighting to begin with, so they couldn't be as battle-hardened as others. Yes, brother? Yes, yes. There weren't tall people. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And, and they're, you know, they're not much taller today. I mean, they're about in that same range uh, in height. So, yeah, if you're talking about a five foot, six foot man, five foot six inches or something around that to, to ten feet or nine feet, I mean, this individual is easily twice the size of any, any normal man. But he's, he's kind of negotiating here, and he's saying, well, why? instead of having this great big battle and we kill a whole bunch of each other, why don't you, cause why don't you just send out your best warrior and me and him a fight? So he's doing that because he's, he's pretty confident, right? Because of his size, he's pretty sure that he can beat anybody they bring out, right? And so this confidence has overwhelmed him. Now, he probably has gotten that confidence in himself, in battles. You know, I can imagine that if he is in a battle with a a beam that is as big as that, a a 15-pound spearhead on it and a sword, you know, that probably his armor bearer could barely carry and pick up, that, you know, anybody that came against him, they probably, he probably took care of them and dispatched them pretty quick. So that has given him a lot of confidence. To say, instead of just taking all the time, you know, you don't really think about these battles back in that day of time, but, you know, the Bible tells us sometimes that 
uh, 15, 20,000 people would die in a battle. Well, that's a lot of people. If you think about some of our stadiums that hold about 40,000 or so, you take about half of that and stroll them all over the landscape, dead. And, you know, it doesn't take long for uh, them to start decaying. And so, you know, all of that has to be took care of after the battle. All of the things that go on during the battle, all that's got to be picked up and cleaned up, so to speak. So rather than do any of that, you send me your best guy, me and him a fight, and whoever wins, wins. And the others become his servants. And he was pretty confident that he could make that deal and they were going to be successful in it. Then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we might fight together. Now when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they, including Saul, were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now this is the king that Israel wanted to fight their battles. But you don't see Saul going after the uh, Goliath, do you? You don't see Saul, we'll know that in just a moment, but Saul's not even prepared for battle. I mean, he's there, but he's way back like we do many times with generals and stuff, right there way back in the back of the ranks. They're not on the front line. And so that's where Saul's at. But he can still hear this giant. And so do all of his men. And so, you know, they would have been looking to him for leadership. <laughs> they would have been looking to him for confidence that God is going to win this battle for us and that we're on the right. And he should have been their cheerleader that day, and they could have had taken some heart in him. You know, you, you don't really have to kill Goliath if you kill the rest of his army, right? What's one man going to do out there at that point? So they could have had some battle and had some success, but Saul wasn't the leader that Israel thought they were getting. They thought he was just going to launch out there and he's going to fight these battles. They're all sitting at the house. Everybody's happy. But that's not the case. It says that they were all dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, David was the son of Ephrathite of Bethlehem and Judah. Notice that's in Bethlehem. Named Jesse, who had eight sons. And in the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul into the battle, and the names of his three sons that went into battle were Eliab, the firstborn, the next to him Abinadab, and the third Shammah. David was the youngest. The three elders followed Saul. But David went back and forth to, from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. So David was allowed to be at the battlefield, which tells us a couple of things that it tells us that he was able to go back and forth. He... He was assisting Saul, but he didn't have to stay there. So he was not of the same age of his brothers. His oldest brother, Eliab, was there and his two younger brothers of Eliab. And he was able to go back and forth. So it was very common for this to take place. And when you look in verse 16, it says, For 40 days the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. Now to me, that's a long time. You're fielding an army out here on the side of this mountain... You know, and you're having to feed them and water them for 40 days and 40 nights. And every day he's going to come out there and challenge these people. You know, I don't know why he chose to, to wait 40 days, you know, for all this to transpire. I don't know. But one, one aspect is that he was just demeaning Israel every day. He's confident he's going to win the battle. And he's saying things to them that he knows is going to make them upset and that he knows is going to make them shiver. There's uh, Casting Crown songs talking about all of the Israelites were shaking in their armor. And you could just hear the armor shaking from fear. Because don't you know he was out there telling them all of the successes he had had in battle? How many other times he had fought armies and had prevailed and how many had been killed. You know, they used to sing songs, didn't they? They sang one later to David about, you know, Saul has his thousands and David has his ten thousands. And, you know, they kind of round up numbers, I'm sure, from the battlefield. But he's probably telling them, for 40 days, this is what's getting ready to happen to you. You know, those battles were bloody and, I mean, they, 
they didn't hold nothing back. There were no rules of engagement, you know, for war back then. And there was a lot of mayhem that was taking place. And he's reminding the Israelites of this. And it's just making them more fearful. Every day, for 40 days and 40 nights, he goes and says these kinds of things to Israel. So 40 days, you know... David's going back and forth to the sheep and back. He's going back, you know, every now and then to, to uh, provide things for Saul and the, and the army to see what's going on. Forty days, forty nights, no change. The guy's still bad-mouthing us and we haven't done a thing. Saul's there, no indication that he's going to lead his, ba- his army into battle, the king that they just had to have. So Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to the camp of your brothers and take these ten cheeses to the commander of their thousand and see if your brothers are well and bring some token from them. So he's wanting information about how is the battle going because it's been going on for 40 days and 40 nights, right? Back and forth. Well, did anything happen today? No, nothing happened today. You know, Goliath came out, challenged everybody. Everybody shook in their armor and they shook in their battle stations and nobody did anything. And so he was providing food uh, that Jesse was taking to his sons via David. And so, because over 40 days, they've got to eat. And so they had to make some provisions. And I'm sure many people were going back and forth from Bethlehem to this site in order to take food and supplies. And so in, in ni- verse 19 it says, Now Saul and all of they and all the men of Israel in the valley of Elith fighting with the Philistines. That's where the fighting battle was going to begin. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line shouting the war cry. So there are, the, both sides are beating their chest, trying to sound bad, rushing up to a line like they're going to come over there, and they're still not crossing the valley. You know, they're just, they're just flaunting. You know, you've seen them birds that they have on these National Geographic, the males put their feathers up and they're flaunting everything. That's what they were doing. They were putting all their feathers up about battle, trying to instill some fear in the enemy. And they weren't actually going to do anything at this point. They were just shouting at each other. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle army against army. So they're, they're all right there on the front, but there's still distance between them because nobody's went to Goliath yet. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. And he talked with them. Behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before, the same words as before. This time David hears them. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled for him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you surely seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. That's quite an offer to get the king's daughter in wedding, right? And to make your debt free. And he's going to give you great riches. So what's happened is the big bad king that they had to have is such a coward now that he's trying to hire his own people, his own army that already are constricted to him. He's trying to give them a bonus, if you will, if you'll go out and fight this guy. A big bonus. Now, you know, I don't know. When I read this, I thought, well, you know, Saul probably thought he ain't coming back. So, you know, I got nothing to lose here because Goliath's going to kill him. But he needed to have somebody go out and challenge this Philistine. So he makes that offer. And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Now, that is quite a statement, isn't it? Who is this man? And he and look who he's talking to, the men who stood by with him. So that was a kind of a scathing remark, wasn't it? You're standing here like a coward. You're supposed to be a warrior. And you're letting that mealy mouth guy over there talk bad about our God. And you're not going to do nothing. You're just not going to do anything. We got people today that talk bad about our God and we don't do anything. 
right? Amen. With not necessarily physical battles, but there's lots of other kind of battles that are raging around us. David said that was enough. And they said to him, and answered him the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him, talking about the riches that Saul had given. Now Eliab, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, so he's within earshot, and his anger was kindled against David and said, Why have you come down? And with whom have you left those few sheep, few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see battle. So why is he so mad at David? All David's done is come down there and said, I can't believe you're letting this guy talk about our God. Yeah. Jealous? Yeah, they hadn't forgot that day, have they? Yeah, they haven't forgotten that day. Now, nothing's really transpired since then. There's been no elaborate anointing king or anything. We still got Saul on the on the picture. But but in there, I mean, they were they were standing there when 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 the prophet was doing the anointing. And it's not this one, not this, and not this, and not this, and not this. And do you have any more? Yeah, we got one in the field. Go get him. And they bring in little David, if you will. And uh, he anoints him as the next king of Israel and not the oldest, eldest son of Jesse. So he's a little upset at his little brother who has supplanted him to be the king of Israel over all of his other brothers. And he, he says it's a presumption of evil in his heart, but of course that was not true, was it? David was of a pure heart when he came down there. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? In other words, all I've done was ask a question. Why are you letting this guy talk down about our God? The whole Israel, Israeli army. And he turned away from him toward another, and he spoke the same way, and the people answered him again as before. When the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent for him. So he started a ruckus. This is repeating through the ranks that, that David is asking, why is there not somebody going to go out and stop this guy from saying this about our God? And David said, to, yes. Yeah. Instead of just Israel. Right. And they probably thought the same thing I did. They, you know, when he was like, why isn't anybody defending it for our God? I thought, you know what, it, why isn't anybody, you know, is there anybody big enough out there to right. go fight it? Right. Not even bringing God right. into the equation. That's what really irked him is what he was saying about God. Yeah. And he had said the same thing over and over again. Forty days. Forty days over and over again about... Uh, about their God. And they just stood there, shouting like they were going to do something, but they weren't going to do anything. And so he sends for, Saul sends for David, and David said, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight this Philistine. So Saul's asking, what, what is this you're saying? You're getting the troops all riled up because you're saying they're you know, basically nothing but a bunch of cowards and you're not going to do anything to defend God's name. And, and I'm in charge of the army. So he gets David to talk to him, and the first thing David says is that you don't need, that nobody needs to have their heart fail over this. Don't lose heart. Don't get discouraged. I'll go out and fight this guy. And Saul said to David, you're not able to go against this Philistine to fight him, for you are but a youth, and, and he has been a man of war from his youth. So he's just pointing out that not... Now, some of the pictures and stuff that you see, uh, many times these pictures that are out there show David as a little boy with a sling and the rocks and, you know, just a very young boy, like maybe 8, 9, 10, somewhere in that age group. But he was probably closer to 17 or 18, but he still wasn't battle-proven. He was still a, a young man, younger than the other. He was still considered to be a youth even at that age. But he had not been a fighter. He had not been... It doesn't mean he never fought. It doesn't mean that he never fought other men. The Bible just doesn't tell us that, but he wasn't battle hardened as Goliath was a man of war from his youth from the time he was young until the age that Goliath was so that's just something that we need to be clear about in the scriptures when we see those cartoons and books for our kids that we clarify to them that this is not some little nine or ten year old boy 
out there getting ready to do the sling. He was not. He said, but he was a, you, you're just not going to be able to, to defeat this guy. And David said to Saul, your Saul servant used to keep sheep with his father. And when he, there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, when I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth, and he rose against me and I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. And your servant struck down both lions and bears. So he's just pointing now that I, I don't know about you guys, but I've seen some bear attacks on, on videos and some lion attacks. I mean, have you ever looked at a lion's paw? It's about the size of your head. And one swipe with that, and we're pretty much done. And yet David had already defeated them. Now just, I don't know. I mean, see, it's, it's the way that God was with David, right? I mean, I don't, y'all probably don't do this, but I role play these things in my mind and say, okay, I'm out watching. His brother said it was a few sheep, so I don't know how many of that is, or 20, 30 sheep, and this lamb and a bear comes up and gets it and takes it. I'm going to say, okay, well, we've got 19 sheep. You know. We go back to the house and say, I've got, I got, ni- I got 19 sheep. He goes after it, grabs it, and kills it, and gets his lamb back. That's right. I'll go after the one. I'll leave the 90 and 9. And go after the one lamb. Yeah, oh yeah. Yeah. He certainly did. But he wasn't fearful like I would have been. He, he, he was full of confidence that he could, he could do that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's right. He fully trusted God. And so that's a great statement for us, isn't it? Right? I mean... You know, how much do we fully trust God about things? How much confidence do we have in Him to help us to do the things that He wants us to do? Do you have the confidence to take on a bear and a lion? But, but He did that, yes. He did that. And that as, here again, His life is showing us things that, even in the Old Testament, that we can glean from it about our confidence and trust in trusting God. That Jesus will leave the 99 to go after the one. It doesn't matter how far away they have went, how far they have wandered out of safety's range. Jesus says, I'll go get them. If they'll call on me, I'll come. I'm near. Right? He's near to those that call upon his name. Yes. And so Saul sees the confidence of David and he says, Go and the Lord be with you. Well, thank you very much. The Lord would have been with you too. Right? You are the king of Israel and the Lord would have been with you too. God did allow him to anoint him as king, didn't he? And so, but, but you're not going. Then Saul clothed David with his armor and he put his helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a coat of mail, again, and strapped David his sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And then David said to Saul, I cannot use these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. So some people say, well, this shows you that he was a little boy and that the armor was too big for him. But that's not what the Scripture says. It doesn't say that it was too big for him. Do you think Saul was stupid enough to put oversized armor on the only warrior that's going to go down and fight Goliath? that's going to weight him down, and it's not the right size. It doesn't fit. You know, it would have been difficult for him to move. That's what it means when he says tested, that he had not wore it before in a battle situation and knew how it felt, how it was going to ride on him, how it was going to defend him, and that he could still operate with it. So he said it had nothing to do with his size. It had to do with the fact that he had never wore armor. He didn't wear any armor to go after the bear and the lions. It was just him and whatever he had on that day and his little belt and sandals, you know. So he had never tested this stuff before. So he said, I, I can't wear these. So he took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand and he chose five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand and he approached the Philistine. Now that's a, a million dollar question. I know you already got this. Is Why did he take so many stones, Right. Some, some people, they ponder that greatly, right? Uh, some churches even call themselves five stones, right? <laughs> it's because that's where they get it from, these five stones that he took. And how many did we know that he actually used? One. Just one. 
Now, what is that indicative of? I don't know that it's indicative of anything. You know, I don't know that the Lord told David. He maybe did, maybe didn't. I don't know. It's not written. I can't write into the scriptures what's not there, right? Maybe he thought, you know, it's a big guy. It may take more than one to kill him. So I better have some more in the pouch. You can't tell him. Once you've struck him and made him mad, say, hold it right there while I find me another stone, you know. You're going to have to reach in there and get him out pretty quick. You know, a habit you take, any time you're going to sling, you've probably got more than one stone, right? So he approaches the Philistine, and the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. What a lucky guy he was. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him. For he, he was but a youth, ruddy, ruddy and handsome in appearance. Ain't that weird how you put ruddy and handsome in the same sentence? And, and that he recognized him, not that he was just a kid, but he was a young man. And he's an older man that had been trained in warfare since his youth. And so he thought, you know, you, this is an, it's an insult. You know, I've been telling you for 40 days how I'm going to dismember you when I get hold of you into little pizzas, and then you send this guy out here to me. That's, this is, it, he didn't say this is the fiercest guy we got. He saw it as a slap in the face to Goli- the great giant Goliath. This little ruddy kid comes out, if you will, a young man, and he's going to fight this battle. It made him mad. Well, you know, psychologically, that was good. That got him off his game a little bit, didn't it? It made him mad. And when the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come out to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his own gods. And David didn't care about that because he knew there were no gods that the Philistines were serving. The Philistine said to David, Come to me and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and the beast of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. Oh, buddy. The God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defiled. Not the armies, the God of the armies of Israel. This day the Lord will deliver you. The Lord will deliver you into my hand. And I will strike you down and cut off your head. See what I'm talking about? They were ruthless. And I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines to this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth that all Israel, all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Wow. This day. No. Lay them out there and let them rot. Watch all. Go up there and take your kids and say, this is what happens to the enemies of God. And that all this assembly, both sides of the mountain, will know that the Lord saves not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hand. What a, what a statement. What confidence. Because we're going to let, some of you guys are going to run off and live, and you're going to tell what He said. The Israelites have God on their side. So you might want to think twice before you go pick a fight with them. When the Philistines arose and came and drew near to meet David, David ran quickly to the battle line to meet the Philistine. Man, alive. As he's running, he's put his hand in his bag and he took out a stone and he slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. The stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. You ever seen that in the movies? It looks, it's something else, because they make it look like it just, it cracked his skull right here in the frontal part. Ricky, it embedded in his brain. And it killed him instantly. Well, he dropped him instantly. Let me put it like that. Here's the final death call. David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in David's hand. That's a that's not a re, that's a kind of a retelling of what it just said, but it's giving you the additional information that he had no sword, right, for the next verse. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it, took the Philistine sword, Goliath's sword, out of its sheath and killed him and cut off his head. Killed him and cut off his head. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. They turned and run. 
And the men of Israel and Judah rose up with a shout and pursued the Philistines. Oh, they're all brave now. <laughs> as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Sharam from Gath to Ekron, they fell dead in the way and were left there for the animals to eat. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered the Philistine camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem. But his armor, he put his armor in his tent. So David keeps Goliath's armor. He keeps his, short, his spear, his shield, his helmet, and his sword. He, and we know that he kept those things because he later asked for them to be given to him. Uh, when he was asking for weapons, they said, well, we have Goliath's sword that you got. And he said, give it to me. So he puts those in his tent. And as soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistines, he said to Abner, the commander of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? And Abner said, as your soul lives, O king, I don't know. And the king said, inquire whose son this boy is. And as soon as David returned from the striking down of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? Yeah. And David said, I am the son of your servant, Jethi, the Behethanite. Pictorially in your mind, that's quite, that was typical of that day to take their heads, right? Uh, and take them, sometimes they would take them back to the city gates and put them on a spear on each side of the gate uh, to show the victory. David was bringing Goliath's head because he told him that's exactly what he was going to do is take his head off his shoulders. I hope you guys got something different from the lesson today. God bless you.